It's good to see you here tonight, and I invite you to take your Bible, please, and open to Psalm 31, Psalm 31 tonight. We're going to look at this beautiful psalm that has a great message for us, Psalm 31, and I just want to read two verses with you, verse 14 and verse 15. But I trust in thee, O Lord, I said, thou art my God. My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies, from them that persecute me. On the 28th of April, 1988, there was a flight. Flight number 243 was en route to Honolulu, Hawaii. And 23 minutes into the flight, um, something terrible happened. The whole top of the airplane from behind the cockpit where the pilots are all the way to the uh, first wing, the whole top of the plane was ripped off. If you can imagine something like that happening, it had to be terrifying. When the captain looked behind him, all he saw was blue sky. And despite everything, miraculously, 10 minutes later, they made an emergency landing. A, full, a full-scale investigation was launched, and what caused this plane to start disintegrating, what they found was the problem was metal fatigue. And metal fatigue was simply the progressive um, damage from uh, the normal uh, stresses over a prolonged period of time. In other words, this was just a plane that was used a lot, and the normal stress wore away the metal until finally the metal gave way. And I, when I read that, I thought, you know, what an analogy of the effects of stress. We're, this is on a plane, but we can make the analogy of, of stress on a person. As Christians, we need to learn what the Bible has to say about dealing with stress, because one of the realities of our modern world is this thing of stress. I'm constantly hearing of people who are either stressed out or burned out or dealing with anxiety in their life, and uh, executives have uh, come up with uh, different measures of how to deal with stress in the lives of their employees. They even have a scale on how to measure stress, and they, they, they kind of rate traumatic events that happen in a, happens in a person's life, and they give it a, a number of stress points that it might take in your life. Whether or not all of that is real or not, I don't know. But I do know this, a lot of people are under a lot of stress. <laughs> That's the bottom line. How do Americans deal with it? Uh, I was reading an article about the way people deal with stress, and, they, and this is what it said. 52% of Americans, the way they deal with stress is by listening to music. 47% think that exercise or walking will help you with your stress. Some people say reading. 44% say they read. 41% say spending time with family or friends. Another 41% said watching TV or movies for two hours a day. Some take simply medication to deal with the stress in their life. And some eat desserts because desserts is stressed spelled backwards. That's my favorite one. But what does the Bible say about dealing with stress? Now, some people might wonder that since the Bible is such an ancient book, quote-unquote, that it doesn't really deal with the issues of, uh, that people face in a modern world with stress. But David, the writer of the Psalms, went through stress like few of us have ever experienced. In fact, in Psalm 31, he writes about this. Now, what was the situation with David? As you look at the background of this, he was in a pretty stressful situation himself. First of all, people were trying to kill him. Most of us have never had to deal with the stress of uh, someone hunting us down or trying to kill us. David had a whole team of people conspiring together against him. Look in verse 4 of chapter 31. Pull me out of the net that they have laid privily for me, David prays, for thou art my strength. And also in verse number 13, David says, For I have heard the slander of many. Fear was on every side while they took counsel together against me. They devised to take away my life. Well, that would be pretty stressful there. But then add to that, friends had turned against David. They had slandered him. They managed to turn friends and neighbors against David. Look at verse number 11 where it says, I was a reproach among all my enemies, but especially among my neighbors and a fear to mine acquaintance. They that did see me without fled from me. So they had so slandered David and so talked about him that when people saw David coming down the street, they would go the other way or go to the other side of the street, so to speak. They didn't want to be around him. Friends had turned against him. 
but also his own sins and failures were causing him great guilt to add to all of that. Look at verse number 10. For my life is spent with grief and my years with sighing. My strength faileth because of mine iniquity. My bones are consumed. David knew that a lot of the problems that was coming about in his life were because of his own sin, and he was feeling the weight of the guilt of sin in his own life. So you add all these things together, you could say that David was really in a pressure cooker. But he also tells us here how to deal with stress. Whatever stresses you may be facing now or may face down the road, it probably can't compare to the stress that David was dealing with here in this, this situation in his life. This psalm isn't coming to you from a, a king who was living in an ivory tower where everything was good in his life. It's coming to you from the crucible of a man who has been there. He knows what it's like to go through difficulty. And the key is what we read in verse number 14. We'll read it again. But I trust in thee, O Lord. I ha- said, thou art my God. And then in verse 15, my times are in thy hand. So David gives us the key to handling stress in our life. And distilled in this one little verse or verses, we could say, are, is really a lot to digest that will help us in dealing with stress in our own life. Really, the big idea that David gives us here is that our response to stress should be personal trust in a personal God. So I want you you to see just three lessons real quick from this psalm that we can gather. Number one, think about the reality of stress, the reality, my times. In verse 15, David refers to my times, and that, that causes me to think about the reality of stress. Notice it's times plural, David's times and our times are marked by instability. We don't know what a day is going to bring. The word times actually refers to uncontrollable uncontrollable changes in life, things that may come our way that we have no control over. One commentator wrote this, he does not use the plural times, in my opinion, without reason, but rather to mark the variety of causalities by which the life of man is usually harassed. In other words, um, you know, we just don't control things that come into our life. Um, our lives are constantly changing. Isn't that part of the reason for the stress that we have, these changes that come in our life? Now, there are some things that come in up, upon our life um, that, you know, are predictable. Um, you know, these are just part of aging. This is part of the, 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 the cycle of life, we could say. For example, you know, some students graduate from high school. That's a, a change in life or college or start a new career. Others will be married the first, for the first time. That's, that's a change in life or maybe having their first child or maybe you have a child that's entering school for the first time. Or perhaps you have a child that's leaving home to go to college. This will be the first time that's ever happened in your life. And that brings a change in your family. I remember the first time, you know, when that happened to us and our family. And then the second child. And then the third, and then the fourth, and now it's an empty nest, and it's wonderful. No, I'm just kidding. But each one of those things brings a, brings a change in life and, and, and a due amount of stress that comes with it. All those changes are predictable, but they will cause sh- stress, and they will cause adjustments in life. Other changes we face will be quite unpredictable and unannounced. These are things that barge into our lives like an intruder in the night. We have no control over it. It might be um, a family member's uh, sudden loss of health, or maybe your own, you're, you're struggling with a health issue that comes. It could be the death of a family member. Um, those things are just hard to even describe, and we're praying for Brother Calvin and his family tonight and the difficulty that he's dealing with. May God be with him and his dear family. Perhaps an aging parent will require, you know, a lot of your time and energy. That's another thing that might just come into your life, a sudden loss of job. There's just a number of these things that come into our life that we can't predict that bring stress. And a lot of people don't deal with these things well. I was reading a statistic. Did you know that 85, 85% of men who are unemployed for nine months or more end up getting a divorce? And, you know, just, this is just part of the, the things that happen when these things come into our life. 
But I want to make three observations about the reality of stress from this psalm before we move on. First is, the time to prepare for stress is before it hits. That's the time to prepare for it. It's obvious from Psalm 31 that David knew God in a very personal, practical, and thorough way. If you read through this psalm, that really stands out. Uh, Note the many attributes of God that David recites throughout the psalm. In verse 1, God is a refuge and a shelter. We also see that in verse 19 and verse 20. David says God is righteous in verse 1, that he will judge righteously, verse 23. David says God is a rock. He's my rock, he says in verse number 3. David says God hears and answers prayer. Again, that's verse 2 and verse 22. That God is a stronghold and a fortress, and David's source of strength. That was a popular metaphor for David, that God being a rock. Uh, We see that in so many of his psalms. When David was running from Saul, he found a rock upon which he could run to and find safety. And David said, God, you are my rock. You are the one that I run to. You are my refuge. God is the God of truth, verse number 5. He's a God of loving kindness, verse 7, verse 16, and verse 21. He's all-knowing, verse 7. He is gracious in verse number 9. Uh, He forgives and he doesn't cast off the rejected. That's all implied in verses 9 down to verse number 13. He has unlimited storehouses of goodness for those who fear him, verse 19, even if they're going through the worst of trials. Now, the reason I give you that quick survey there is to let you know that David didn't learn all this about God out of the blue. David had developed a walk with God. He had spent many times... uh, thinking about who God is, many, much time praying. David began to, to know God through his word, through uh, tending his father's sheep. He had a lot of time to f- focus on God. And David became what the Bible calls the man after God's own heart. So that when the crisis hit, David had resources in God to lean on. So again, the time to prepare for uh, stress is before it hits. And that is by developing your time with the Lord. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 20 to verse 33 also makes this point. The time to get wisdom is before the calamity strikes. Otherwise, if we call out for wisdom when we're in the crunch, what does the Bible say? Wisdom will laugh at us during that time. So if you're not in a crisis, it's time right now to sink down deep your roots in the Lord. It's time right now to walk with the Lord. Spend time alone with God. Get into the Word of God. Let it feed your own soul. Let His Word confront your life about your, your own sin and things that you need to deal with in your own life. Be ready when those times come. So we prepare for stress before it hits. But also, here's another thing that we see. Even if our stress is the consequence of sin, we can take refuge in God. We can take refuge in God. It might be that you're battling with sin in your life and you feel, I failed so much. And sometimes our natural reaction when we fail with sin is to maybe just throw up our hands or give up or maybe say, you know, God doesn't want to hear my prayer. God doesn't want me to come to him. Oh, how wrong that is. The time to run to God is after your failure. The time to run to God is after you have um, had to deal with sin in your life and perhaps have failed. Even if our stress is because of our own failures, the consequences of sin that we feel in our life, you can still run to God. Because again, we see in verse 10, David recognized his own sin was behind the crisis that he was in. He understood that. In verse number 10, again, he said, For my life is spent with grief, my years with sighing, my strength faileth because of mine iniquity, and my bones are consumed. This leads me to think that this psalm was perhaps written in connection with Absalom's rebellion, which was a consequence of what? David's sin with Bathsheba, right? This was part of the consequence that God said David was going to face because of sins in his life. And so if we bring our sins to God and confess them, of course he will, God is merciful. He will forgive. But beloved, that does not mean that you will not feel the consequences of sin. God doesn't remove the consequences of sin from us when he forgives us. But David's experience shows that even if our calamity is the direct result of our sin, we can still run to God 
and we can find refuge in God, and we can find comfort and know that he will receive us. And what's also interesting about this, it's significant that David's enemies were still condemning him long after God had forgiven him. Scripture says that the sin, uh, the sin of adultery is a, brings a reproach that will never be wiped away. And unfortunately, this is true in David's experience. They were all talking about David and his sin. They were, David said his name was a reproach in verse 1, that they were making him ashamed in verse 11. Again, the word reproach in verse 13, they were slandering him in verse 17, putting him to shame in verse 20. No doubt they were calling him a hypocrite because he claimed to follow God and he was guilty of adultery and murder. And so the charges were true. But David's enemies didn't know the sincerity of his repentance, and they didn't understand the magnitude of God's grace. We must never condone, condone sin, but we must be careful not to judge or reject repentant sinners when they come for forgiveness. Thank God that he's gracious. And through the blood of Jesus, he forgives all our sin. And so David here realizes this, and his sin is the problem, but yet he still runs to God. But there's another thing I want you to see here, and that's this. God will never allow us to go through more stress than we can bear if if we trust in him. Remember what the Bible says, that God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted or tried above that you are able. Though David's trial was terrifying, so much so that you read in verse 13 that David even despaired of life. Still, God gave him the strength to endure what David was going through. Now, let me just tell you something. God isn't into easy solutions. He usually doesn't remove the trial the instant we seek him. But what God does do is through his grace, he gives us the strength and the ability to deal with the trial. He allows it to, us to go through it. What's the song say? He gives more grace when the burdens grow greater. That's so very true. It's when we trust in God in the midst of severe distress that we prove that God is faithful. And it's often... It's the waiting for God to deliver us that's the most difficult thing. We're waiting for God to get us out of this. But during that time, that's when God strengthens our faith as we learn to wait upon him. So number one, there is the reality of stress, my times. But I want you to see number two, what I call the resource for stress, God's hand. Again, he says in verse 15, my times are in your hand. So this is the reality of the sovereign personal God. David's times may have been unstable. His times may have been changing, but David's God was stable and unchanging. God is a rock. God is a fortress. And David's times were in the hands of David's God. And David was not subject to the whelms of those who sought his life. David knew that his life was in the hand of God, and because of that, because God was sovereign over all of his life, there's a sense in which David was invincible until God was done with him, because God is sovereign. One of the most comfort, comfort, comforting truths to remember in trials is that all of those things are under the sovereign hand of our God. My times are in your hand. All that I'm going through, Father, that is in your hands. It's in God's sovereign control. So we see under this, first of all, the God who holds our times in his hands is a sovereign God. In Daniel 2.21, it uses the same Hebrew word for times, where it says this, it is he who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. Our God is not on the edge of heaven biting his nails as he sees the rebellion of the human race. That's not our God. No. David describes God better in Psalm 2 where he says, he that sits in the heavens shall laugh or scoff. If, if puny man thinks that he can do anything to thwart the sovereign purposes of God, that's laughable. God is absolutely sovereign in his, uh, in his rule over our life and in history. And God has a plan. So we can know that when tragedy strikes, 
God was not asleep. God was not on vacation. This is not something that caught God by surprise. No, this is all part of God's sovereign will. Um, I, I read of a pastor in a magazine called Table Talk. I read of a pastor and his wife who were called home from a summer vacation with the news that their four-year-old who was staying with friends had been flown to an intensive care unit. The reason for it is he was diagnosed with an acute uh, lymphocritic um, leukemia. That same summer, their newborn underwent surgery to repair a cleft lip, and the wife was laid low with a de uh, degenerated disc. And the pastor shared how his knowledge of God's loving sovereignty was the rock that helped him during this time of crisis in his life. And during that time, he had some friends recommend to him a book, a book that many people have read by a rabbi named Harold Kushner. It's a bestseller, and the title of the book is this, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. I don't know if you've ever heard of that book or read it, but the whole thesis of the book is that God is good, but he's not sovereign and he's not all-powerful. That's what the book basically proposes. God's good, but he's not all-powerful and he's not sovereign. And some things happen and God just didn't see it coming. And yet he's still good. And so thus, God can't help all the suffering that's happening in the world. And someone gave this book to this pastor to read, thinking that it would help him through this crisis in his life. And the pastor wrote and said this, incredibly, suffering people are supposed to find comfort in this. Am I really supposed to be relieved to know that there are forces in this world outside the control of God? And then he said this, God's sovereignty is a tremendous comfort. And that is so true. Your times, my times, are in his hand. And we need to remember that. Not only the God who holds our times in his hand, not only is he a sovereign God, but also the God who holds our time in his hands is a personal God. He's a personal God. Notice in verse 14 where David writes, Thou art my God. You are my God. The flavor of the whole psalm is personal. It's intimate. Although God is sovereign, he's transcendent, yet he's also personal. He's imminent. He's right here with us. He's a personal God. A lot of people think that the sovereignty of God means that God is cold and he's distant. You know, they have this deterministic way of viewing life. You know, they, they just don't really see this sovereign God as being someone who's also close and personal, and that's a wrong way to think about God. Beloved, he is absolutely sovereign, but he's also very close, and he's very personal, and he's intimate with his people. In verse number 7, notice what David wrote. He said this, I will, I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy, for thou hast considered my trouble. Thou hast known my soul in adversities. David knew that he wasn't alone through this. He knew that although God was sovereign and that his times were in his hand, he also knew that God was personal. And God knew all about David's trouble. In fact, God was with David through that trouble. He was right there with him. God is not severe and distant, off in some corner of the universe saying, I ordained it, now you grit your teeth and endure it. That's not God. God is personal. God is caring. And God is with us closer. We can sense his presence even more when we go through that dark valley than at any other time because that's when he makes his presence real to us. Even during your trials, you can know that he cares for you very, very deeply. And there's also a, a, third, a third thing here in this psalm that we see. My times, that points to the reality of stress. God's hand, that points to the resource for stress. But then there's a third thing I want you to see, the response to stress. And we see this in verse 14. Look again at the first part of verse 14. But I trusted in thee, O Lord. That's my response. That's what our response is to be. I have to put my trust in God. Personal trust in the sovereign personal God gives us inner stability in the midst of outer instability. That's where we get our strength. That's what helps us in the times of stress. Trust is the vital link that connects God's 
sovereign love with my distress. Now, again, when I trust in God in the midst of the stressful situation, he doesn't usually remove the source of stress immediately, but he gives us this strength and this stability in the midst of this crisis. This is where David was when he wrote this psalm. This is what he was experiencing, God's stability in the midst of this stressful situation. So notice under this, first of all, trusting God is a spiritual, I call this a spiritual resignation. And when I say resignation, I don't mean giving up or quitting or resigning yourself to fate. But what I'm talking about is just turning things over to God, putting them in God's hands. Take your hands off the situation. And notice in this psalm how many times David refers to God's hands as opposed to the hands of others. That would be a good thing to go through and see that. David puts the situation into God's hands. In verse 5, he says, into thy hands, he says, I commit my spirit. And again in verse 15, my times are in thy hand. I read about one man who was suffering these little daily deaths that people suffer in the form of job stress and tension. And finally, after he had been overworked to the point of of exhaustion and near collapse, he uh, basically said he he had an insight. He received a clear insight about what he was supposed to do. He prayed, and he had a clear insight. And he said this, he had to resign as the manager of the universe. That was the insight. And God accepted his resignation. Some of us are trying to manage the universe. We want to manage the lives of the members of our families. We want to run things at the church our way. And why doesn't the president do what I'm asking him to do? Why doesn't the government do the things the way I think that they should be done? You know, what we need to do, all of us together, is to stop trying to manage the universe. And guess what? Just give that over to God. That's not our job. That's his job. I can't manage other people's lives. I got enough trouble managing my own life. But you know what the Bible says? Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. When you put your mind on God, and the word stayed here means leaning upon. So if you're leaning on God and trusting in him, he will keep you in perfect peace. Take the back seat. Get out of the driver's side and go sit in the back and let God drive the vehicle. Let God take control. He's a much better driver. Remember, you and I are not the general managers of the universe. This is what David meant when he said, my times are in your hands. And therefore, um, God, I entrust all this to you. I'm going to put all my trust in you. Since my times are in your hands, you're in control, what good is it for me to try to take things? I just trust you. I I entrust all these things to you. Trusting God is a spiritual resignation where I just give these things over to God. But then there's a second thing. Trusting God is a willful resignation determination. There's a sense, of course, in which your times are in God's hands, whether you trust them or not. They're still in God's hands. But that's not the sense in which David's times were in God's hands. The important principle here is that David's times were in God's hands because David determined, he deliberately determined that he was going to put them there for his own self. This was something that David applied to his own life. Look, God's sovereign whether you like it or not. The best thing for you to do is submit to that. And, and just put it all, and make that determined decision, I'm going to just put it all in your hands, Lord. That's where peace comes from, when you just put it all in his hands. This isn't automatic with us. We have to do this constantly. The word I in verse 14 is a strong adversative, and, and it's very emphatic in the Hebrew. David is saying, no matter what my friends may do to me, no matter whether former friends abandon me, or whatever happens for my part, God, I am determined, I will trust you. Doesn't matter what happens out on the outside. God, I'm going to trust you. Trusting God is a spiritual resignation. Trusting God is a willful determination. But here's the the last thing. Trusting God is a personal application. Look at verse 2 and 3 again of, of chapter 31. Notice where it says, bow down thine ear to me, deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for a a house of defense to save me. And then in verse 3, David says, for thou art my rock and my fortress. 
Now, he says that God is his rock in verse 3, and yet he asks God to be his rock in verse 2. Someone says, well, that sounds like double talk, doesn't it? Well, but it isn't. Some say, well, how can God be and yet be asked to be a refuge all at the same time? But notice the two words, to me, that's the key. To me, that's where there's the personal trust in verse 2. Save me at the end of verse number 2. In other words, what you are, God, in your very nature, a rock and a stronghold, be that to me right now in my current crisis. This is a personal application. This is what David is doing here. This is called making theology practical. It's one thing to have good theology. It's another thing to embrace it and make it practical in your own life. And that's what David is doing here. He's putting theology to work in his life. David is talking about the revealed character of God and bringing it down into his own experience in a personal, conscious, and deliberate way. That is personal trust. Spurgeon understood this. He said this. um, He says says, um, that it teaches us to ask God that we may, quote, enjoy and experience what we grasp by faith. And that's true. We know by faith that God is many things because the Bible tells us that he is, but that's a very different thing from proving those things in our own personal experience. We have to personally apply this. God, you are this, then be that to me. I need that right now in my own life. But then I said that was the last thing, but one more after this. Trusting God is a continual appropriation. In other words, this personal, deliberate choice to trust God, it's got to be continual. It's got to be continual. Why? Because we all have the bad habit of taking things back that we place into God's hands. How many have ever done that? Don't raise your hand. That would be all of us, right? We give it to God. We have victory in that. The next morning, we take it back. And that's just human nature, to take back things that we give to God. We say, Lord, my times are in your hand, but please give them back. And maybe you're thinking, you know, yeah, I've tried that, and, you know, I get anxious still. It's because you keep taking it back. Welcome to the fallen human race. This is what David did. Derek Kidner in his commentary observes that this psalm is unusual and that it makes the journey from anguish to assurance twice. In other words, this journey that David takes and putting things in God's hands, it happens twice here in this Psalms. In chapter 31, verse 6 through 8, David reaches a point of calm trust, but then he plunges back into anxiety in verses 9 to 13 before reaffirming his trust in verses 14 to 24. So this is really true to life, isn't it? God, it's all in your hand. I'm going to take it back. I'm going to put it back in your hand. That's really the whole pattern of this Psalm here, and that is so true to life. Personal trust is like that. You wrestle with your anxieties, and finally, you cast them on the Lord, and when you do, you experience his peace. Don't take them back. Don't take them back. (laughs) That's the key there. Focus on God. uh, Deliberately affirm your trust in him over and over again. That is the point here. Trust is a continual appropriation. Trust is actively, personally laying hold of the character of God as revealed in his word and applying it to your own situation in your own life. When you know this, the God of David, as your God, then you will experience stability like David did in the midst of difficult circumstances. You can handle whatever stress comes upon you because you've placed your times into his hand, the hand of a sovereign and personal God. So there's the reality of stress, my times, the resource for stress, God's hands, the response to stress, but as for me, I trust in you. I'm going to put my trust in you. It's interesting if you look at this that, you know, there are many characters that appealed to Psalm 31, and this, this, this wonderful psalm here. If you read through the Old Testament, you'll find that other men refer to this. For example, Jonah, when he prayed, uh, prayed out of the belly of the fish, he quotes part of Psalm 31, verse 6. Jeremiah, who was 
uh, the weeping prophet had a very difficult ministry. He also quotes part of this psalm. But for me, the, the main one who quoted this psalm that we can really look to is our Lord Jesus himself. You realize Jesus quoted Psalm 31? What verse? Look at verse number 5. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. Remember what Jesus, when he said that? Jesus was on the cross, and here he, he quotes from this, this verse. So obviously our Lord Jesus meditated on this psalm, knew this psalm, as he quoted it from the, from the cross. He endured the supreme stress more than anyone when he endured all of our sins, took them all upon himself on the cross at Calvary. And so we must be like our Lord Jesus and trust ourselves into the hands of a loving, personal, sovereign God. That's how you manage stress in your life. Let's bow for prayer together. Father, thank you for this beautiful psalm, how rich it is, Lord, and how we need to apply this in our own life. I know that there are many, under the sound of my voice, that wrestle with anxiety and stress, changes of life that are a part of just the cycle of life and aging, but also the changes that intrude into our life, things that come in unexpectedly that crush us that break us, that tear our world apart. And, Lord, how can we survive these things? And, Lord, we read here how that you give an inner strength. You give a grace, a stability to those who look to you and put their trust in you and who say with submission, my times are in your hands and trust in a loving, sovereign, heavenly Father. Father, I just pray that we will learn to apply this. I pray for those who may be going through deep waters right now, Lord, that you will give them an inner strength and a grace that comes only from you as we apply these things in our own life. Teach us this every day, Lord. May every day we be reminded that our times are in your hands, and therefore I will trust in you. I will trust in you. And we pray all this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.